With my last two videos being spent explaining how we got here, we can finally focus on the cut content from the anime. No longer do we have to be confused with the rapid pacing and sudden shift in story developments. Well, at least I hope not. So, if you haven't had a chance to watch these last two videos, then I highly recommend doing so before you do this one. There's a lot of stuff regarding the other heroes that you definitely need to know for this arc. Key plot points that explain why now Fumi is even out here in the first place. But before we get started, if you've ever thought about reading up on Shield Hero for yourself, then now would definitely be the best time to get started. My partners over at Bookwalker are having a massive promotion to kick off the new season for it. So, up until May 19th, not only can you get the entire digital novel or manga collection for 25% off, but you can also get up to 40% coin back on the individual ebook purchases. That's 22 volumes of light novels and 17 volumes of manga, instantly available to read at a pretty enormous discount. Plus, if it's your first time using Bookwalker to buy anything, then you can also use code ANYNEWS to get $5 off your first ebook purchase. So, even if you don't want to read the entire Shield Hero collection, you can at least pick up Volume 7 to follow along from where the anime is. With a deal as good as this one, though, I can't recommend enough using the link below to get the bundles. They're honestly the best bang for your buck if you're planning to read the entire series. But now, let's talk about some Shield Hero. Episodes 27 and 28, Ruins in the Fog, covering chapters 13 to 15 of Volume 6. With the other heroes having run away from Melromark, it was the place they were heading that reminded Rishia of something she'd noticed while studying. You see, after numerous encounters with these yet-to-be-identified monsters, she was the first to realize that they were actually familiars, servants of a legendary being known as the Spirit Tortoise. Not much was known about what this creature actually was, but to now Fumi it sounded surprisingly similar to the four symbolic animals from his world. Benevolent creatures who were often used to represent the four cardinal directions in video games. So, if that was something which was common in video games from his world, then it was more than likely that it was also common for the other heroes. It's likely they knew the Spirit Tortoise was an event that they could capitalize on, and as a result fled Malremark in an attempt to get there first. The massive oversight they failed to consider though was that this world had no reason to work the same way that their games did. Sure, the Spirit Tortoise they knew may have been easily killable and dropped valuable items, but the one from this world certainly wasn't. According to the legends of the past, it took a massive amount of effort for the previous ancient heroes to even seal it, a method of defeating it that was taken to the grave with them. So, unless their games revealed a similar method of defeating the tortoise, it's unlikely the other heroes would have any success fighting against it, leaving no choice but for now Fumi to chase after them. Of course, he could just do nothing and let their actions run its course, but that was a path Vittoria said would result in sacrifices, a path to save the world which would end up costing everything else. That being the case, now Fumi would spend the next four days traveling east trying to catch up to them, and it was here on the fourth night of non-stop traveling that the climactic event marking Season 2's beginning would finally happen. The feeling was similar to that of a wave having been started, but the countdown for the next one showed it was two days away still. Instead, what appeared on his HUD was a brand new icon. A blue hourglass with a single 7 propped up right next to the wave countdown which was frozen now. At first, Naofumi thought he could use this as a chance to escape his duties as the shield hero, but simply knowing that many people would suffer if he did was more than enough to keep him from doing so. Naofumi knew there was too much at stake to abandon his role now. So, as he continued onward towards the east, a new report from the Queen would reveal the Spirit Tortoise was on the move now. It wasn't the other heroes who had awoken it, but they did continue to pursue it in hopes of fighting it, a fight Naofumi was certain they would lose. Then, to make matters even worse, Ever since that last report of the heroes going to fight the tortoise, the Queen hadn't heard anything since from the shadows who were trailing them, resulting in that scene where Rishio would start chasing after nothing. It is a tad bit out of place the way they did it here in the anime, but when given the context of them going missing after trying to fight the tortoise, her immense concern for Itsuki starts to make more sense. Now, after two more days of travel, Naofumi would finally arrive at his destination and begin his setup of a front line with a coalition army. But unlike how this coalition was a major focus in the anime, there wasn't really much to it in the novels. All there was was now Fumi's personal party, a group of knights handpicked by the queen herself, then several soldiers taken from a neighboring country. It was during the time it had taken to bring this force together though that the tortoise would wipe out five cities, three forts, and two castles, indicating a pattern of destruction that seemed to focus on maximum casualties. That being the case, Naofumi knew he couldn't wait for the seven star heroes like how he wanted to. 
they were on their way from their respective countries, but the days it would take for them to arrive was far too long for the people who needed them now. There was no telling how many people would die if Naofumi didn't take action immediately. So, with him being the only person anyone could rely on, Naofumi had no choice but to take on the role of hero here. And the first step to do that was to take every possible option into consideration, including the one that ancient heroes had used to defeat it before. Their exact method wasn't entirely known, but according to the legend passed down for generations, the ancient heroes were able to get into its shell using the cracks on its back, then seal its heart away using some form of unknown attack. It was a way of stopping it that could only be done from the inside. The main problem with that though was that the time spent with Naofumi inside the turtle would undoubtedly result in the decimation of the army who had helped him to get there. A colossal sacrifice Naofumi wasn't willing to make for a plan he wasn't sure would even work. So, with that currently set on hold, there was an attempt to come up with more plans during a meeting with all the military commanders. A discussion that started similar to how we saw in the anime, but ended up concluding completely opposite from how it was supposed to. Rather than now Fumi storming out to do things solo, it was here that he truly demonstrated his ability to become the hero figure. Keep in mind though that this wasn't something he even really wanted to do in the first place. The only reason he decided to step up at all was simply due to a promise he made to the people who believed in him. A promise that made him strive to act in a way those people could be proud of. So, even if he didn't really care for the people he would be saving, if he wanted to be the person Raftalia and the others envisioned him to be, then Naofumi knew he had to become this champion of justice. No longer could he act in the rogue manner that he usually did. With the other heroes being as useless as they were, it was now more than ever that the world needed a true hero. So, as the various military commanders began to argue over what needed to be done, it was now Fumi who had brought them all to silence. Unlike how we saw in the anime though, he didn't judge them for how they were acting, but instead told them to put their faith in him. It was this brief yet impactful speech on what it meant to be a hero, something you'd expect from a character like All Might. Then, the more now Fumi got into it, the more he couldn't believe that it was him saying these words. All this talk about justice just felt so unfamiliar to him, much to the point that he couldn't even recognize himself anymore. If that was the person everyone needed him to be though, then that was the person he would force himself to become. It was an iconic moment in which Naofumi had truly become the shield hero, thus quelling all the doubts any person in the room would have had in him. What's interesting to note about this whole act though is that that's exactly what it was. The whole speech was nothing more than a comforting set of lies to get what he wanted, a series of bluffs intended to prevent the heroes from losing any more credibility. Now, I'm not sure if that's exactly how Naofumi had felt about it, but it is what he had told Eclair after the meeting had finished. Perhaps he just didn't want her to start seeing him as more heroic than he actually was. Regardless, the gist of the matter was that Naofumi had gotten what he wanted. Everyone was now coordinated behind his lead, and they would proceed with a plan that was likely to minimize casualties. As for what that plan was, well, apparently it centered around a single focused magic attack. Now Fumi would buy time and keep the spirit tortoise at bay while the coalition's wizards would work together to cast magic that would seal it. That was the general idea behind how they were approaching it. Other than that, there wasn't much else to say regarding the preparations. We kind of just go straight from talking about what they were planning to do, right to the moment before they begin the assault. Before we get to that though, I do want to take a moment to clarify just how massive this tortoise really was, mainly because I feel the anime didn't do justice for it. So, aside from literal mountains being carried on its back, the tortoise was big enough to cause earthquakes just from its footsteps alone. Now Fumi could be several kilometers away from where it was going and still feel the tremors of its movements as if it was right next to him. Its face alone was the size of a village and its likely legs were gigantic enough to stomp entire castles. One close-up glance was all it took to realize why this monster was able to cause so much destruction. So, with Naofumi and the Coalition practically next to it, the only thing preventing them from running away was the people relying on them. Well, that and the hordes of familiars standing between them and the tortoise. That being the case, Naofumi prepped himself by switching to his best shield, then charged forward with a combo of Hate Reaction and Shooting Star Shield. The former would aggro most of the monsters in the area, while the latter provided a force field as he steadily pushed further, resulting in an ensuing swarm of bats dense enough to block out the sun. Luckily for Naofumi, his defenses were much stronger than that of the combined attacks of these familiars. So, even with his barrier taking quite the beating, there was no worry that it was going to break anytime soon. Plus, he could just cast it again to bring it back to full strength. 
It was as he continued to slowly push himself forward that everyone else would do their part to attack the familiars. It was a moment intended to showcase the results of everyone's training. A peculiar thing to note about the old lady in particular though is that Naofumi was so impressed with how she was fighting that his first thought was how he wanted to make her his slave. Of course, Naofumi understood just how absurd that was, but that was just the way this world had made him. He had come to the point where if he found a strong fighter, then his initial response was a desire to add them to his party. A process in which becoming his slave was pretty much a prerequisite now. In any case, with Naofumi providing constant support from the rear, it was only a matter of time before they arrived right at the base of the Spirit Taurus. An achievement that was immediately met by an errant kick from it. Naofumi did have time to prepare a barrier for the impact, but the force of such a large object had shattered it almost instantly. There was nothing left to hold back this monstrous foot other than Naofumi and his shield. So it was as he resisted the impact with all his might that everyone else would defend the perimeter from the oncoming familiars, giving Naofumi enough time to fend off what was essentially a direct kick. It was once he did that Naofumi became significantly more confident in his ability to do this. I mean, if a direct kick wasn't enough to take him out, then perhaps he could defend against everything else the tortoise had. As much as he would have liked that to be true though. The tortoise's next attack struck back in a way that seemed as if it was trying to prove otherwise. Now Fumi's party did manage to get several attacks in on its head, but that was quickly countered when it began to use gravity magic. Much like how Ost had used that same magic in the anime, the tortoise activated its own version to incapacitate everyone standing outside of Now Fumi's barrier. Only the old lady was able to withstand it using the Hengen Muso style. Then, once it had finished buying itself a bit of time, the tortoise began to charge up an attack I can only compare to Godzilla's. It was an electric breath that charged very similarly to his atomic beam. So, as crackling electricity began to fill its mouth, Naofumi quickly switched to the Soul Eater shield, activated Shield Prison, then cast a barrier on it, all of which collapsed from the immense damage almost immediately. The attack itself was really only a few seconds long, but to Naofumi it felt as if it was an eternity. It was an infinite loop of pain that surpassed anything he'd ever felt in this world before. Even after comparing it to the damage from Blood Sacrifice, the burning sensation he experienced here was far worse than that. He was actually surprised he'd been able to survive at all. In fact, if not for a healing spell anonymously cast mid-attack, then it's actually fairly likely that he wouldn't have. Someone had clearly saved him when they noticed he was struggling. Now, just to clarify on how strong this attack actually was, well, everywhere aside from where Naofumi was protecting was completely obliterated from the impact of it. There was even a mountain far in the distance that had been reduced to rubble by it. So, out of the fear of having to deal with this attack again, Naofumi coordinated one final assault to deal with the tortoise for good this time. By using Shield Prison together with a collection of force fields, he was able to protect their push from the bombardment of stomps the tortoise was trying to squish them with. Then, once they got close enough to finally attack, there was very little time to do so since the tortoise had begun charging its beam attack again. The main problem with that was that, unless Raftalia and Philo charged their attacks for a suitable amount of time, there was no way they'd be able to deliver a finishing blow like how Naofumi wanted them to. So, rather than give a half-hearted attempt and end up failing, Naofumi instead placed himself right at the front and prepared to tank the attack head-on. At least this time he knew what he was defending against, and if nothing else it would buy Raftalia and Philo a few seconds to make their attacks even stronger. So, what Naofumi had produced in this moment was the most defensive position he'd ever taken. A combination of five different shield skills intended to weaken the attack with each subsequent layer it went through. First was the force field made by Shooting Star Shield, then the next three were overlapping iterations of Airstrike Shield, all of which eventually led to the final barrier of Shield Prison. Then, once that was destroyed, it would only leave Naofumi after. By the time the beam had made it through all those barriers, though, Naofumi could tell that it was far weaker than when it had hit him the first time. Not only did the additional preparations help to dampen the blow, but his focus on channeling magical energy to his hands increased his defenses as well. It was the aspect of his training that the old lady had been trying to teach him. In any case, with Naofumi having blocked the attack, Raftalia and Philo were now free to unleash their full power. An impressive joint attack that occurred so quickly, the tortoise didn't even have time to react to it. It was a clean cut that decapitated the monster without any resistance at all. And unlike how we saw in the anime, Naofumi wasn't even needed to help them out with it. The whole endeavor was carried out by Raftalia and Philo alone. But yeah, that's pretty much how this battle had gone in the novels. One thing you probably should keep in mind though was that this whole thing was done without Ost as well. 
Her role doesn't come into play until a little bit later, something I'll get deeper into with the next cut content. Until then though, don't forget you can also read ahead yourself by purchasing the books off of Bookwalker. And if it is your first time using it to buy anything, then you can use code ANYNEWS to get $5 off your first ebook purchase. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!